If nothing else, Clay, this episode of Deadwood called A Rich Find gives you the timeless advice that when you feel a shit coming on, remember to drop your fucking pants. Something my grandfather <laughs> always used to tell me growing up as a, a young whippersnapper. Well, I, I always thought I was the only person who peed their pants at cemeteries. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even Halloween. It's just the no. grief that's getting to Calamity Jane at this point. Not even I guess drunk. It's just a it's just a cultural thing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cemeteries are scary and do you remember the last time you, you urinated on yourself? <laughs> is that is that something oh, geez. that's ever happened? I don't know. I, what 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 time is it? It's uh this is a this is a question for I'm trying to think of a way to define that. I don't I don't gets, think it gets more frequent as we get older. I'm, it does, yeah. It's it's a reverse U curve or whatever they call it, a reverse bell curve or something like that. It's it's a it's high up at the zero and then it swings back around once you get to seventy years old or something. I don't think I have in no. I can't see a reason why I would. It, it's kind of been a built in assumption about Jane's character that she drinks that much and even when drunk in college, I never urinated on myself. Maybe I just wasn't doing it hard enough, but I don't think, I don't think I've ever uncontrollably done it. Right. Yeah. Even from like a, an extreme need to go, you know what I mean? No, 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 I've never, I've never lost control of my bladder. <laughs> That's good. Except you go while places. in scary, scary cemeteries. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's it's uh, to be expected. We're going to be talking about the episode called "A Rich Find." This is the Something Pretty podcast. And we're going to play some music. We're going to take a break. We're going to be right back and we're going to break it down. You're listening to a podcast that is a lie agreed upon. Join Wes and Clay as they discuss HBO's Deadwood and tell you something pretty. This is A Rich Find. It's the sixth episode halfway through the season of the third season. It was directed by Tim Hunter, written by Alex Lambert. In a rich find, Charlie Utter finds Hearst in the cell in his freight office next to Pasco's corpse. Utter wonders if there is a connection between the two. Swearingen visits the Bullock house. Jane and the nigger general build a coffin for Hostetler. Odell, the son of Aunt Lou, arrives in Deadwood from Liberia. Blazanov is still upset over Pasco's brazen murder. Leon won't be able to supply Alma's dope any longer. Trixie confronts Alma, quote, you've fallen back with a fucking child in your home, end quote. Odell tells Hearst he has found gold in Liberia. Tolliver confides with Hearst that Alma's an addict and suggests someone might adjust the quality of her dope. Joni convinces a drunken Jane to come back to her room as Shaughnessy's. Bullock tells Swearingen that they should strike first. Swearingen prepares for a meeting of the camp elders. Quote, be baffled among friends, end quote. This is it. Halfway through the season, we are up to a rich find. And did you have anything you wanted to say before we get into this one, Clay? <laughs> I didn't know if you, uh, if that, that uh, <laughs> summary caught up uh, any of your, anything that got triggered well, inside thank, you. thank you for asking. I'd like to take this time to announce my retirement from the game of basketball. There you go. There you go. That's why we're here. This is really this this podcast is just an off brand uh, offshoot of your NBA career, which is going swimmingly at this point. <laughs> so this is a rich find. We're halfway through the season. I don't know if that means anything to you. I find these plot summaries a little bit weird in the book. Mm -hmm. um, this is the what is this book called? This is called the Deadwood Stories of the Black Hills book, which was it's like a coffee table book that Milch put together. I guess um, it has some weird things like the pictures that are atop of each of the blurbs, some of them are wrong. They're from like the wrong episode. And hmm. the one for the previous episode, A Two-Headed Beast, is the picture of Charlie in the cell with Pasco saying like, this is your fucking knife, George Hurst, or whatever. Um, so I, I just thought I'd bring that up. It's not really apropos of anything. It's just kind of the, the chaos of the book matches the chaos of uh, the Deadwood production, I guess. Sounds like it's apropos of the book not having a good editor. That's true. Yeah, it needs a Merrick in there, just putting stuff in that everybody wants to see and wants to hear about. What did you think of the rich find, or a rich find? Fucking postal contract. Got to bring these in, first thing. I'll be right with you. Is he only a goddamn fool, or so stupid he thinks he's accomplished something? Who? You know goddamn well who I mean. Who are you? You goddamn well know that, too. 
I know from the sheriff locking you up between sundown when I left and my coming back now, you must have fucked up at the interval. Were you drunk? You and I have met. At the hotel buffet? Yes. But we wasn't introduced. I'm George Hurst. Were you drunk, George Hurst? This fellow didn't keep you up here, did he? He didn't like fart or snore too much for you, did he, Mr. Hurst? I mean, he didn't buy... Holy shit! Jesus! The cocksucker's dead, George! Look! He's got a fucking knife in his chest. That ain't your fucking knife, is it, George Hurst? Uh, I thought it was good. I, um... I have to say, I am immediately very intrigued with what's going on with Odell. Sure. Just because I, you're, you're uh, a huge fan of the Gooding family, and this is the latest <laughs> entry in that. Was he, is he a Gooding? I was going to say, he looks... He looks... He, I, I couldn't... He, you, <laughs> he, he looked like a Gooding. He does, yeah. He's the younger brother of Cuba, Gooding Jr. Is that Omar? This Gooding? is Omar Gooding. What do I know him from? He was some from on some... Like a kid show or something? Was he? He was in. Uh, I had the page open. If I, if you give me a chance, I can look it up. But I don't know exactly uh, off the top of my head what he's from. Well, anyway, I was. Uh, I'm very intrigued. At oh, what's sorry. Going he on was with... from Hanging with Mr. Cooper. That's what it is. Hanging with Mr. Cooper, a show I never actually watched. <laughs> it was always but on was after school. Of. It was always on after school at, on some network. I watched it occasionally, but I could. It was one of those shows that it was just on the TV after after school, and I could not. I watched a bunch of it, but I could never tell you what happened in it. I couldn't tell you any of the characters' names outside of Mister Hooper. He was a principal. Well, even, even, Mr. Cooper. even there, even there, you missed it. So <laughs> I missed that layup, unlike your NBA career. But Mister Cooper, I think he was a principal or something. Anyway, that's it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I I'm I'm very intrigued by what's going on there. Uh, I think because uh, his mother was was established as such a, a a strong willed character to see her get so flustered is very fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked I really liked the end where for maybe one of the first time well not maybe it's not I don't know if it's the first time but when given the option Al chooses to not go in guns blazing. Right, but to actually um, have a conversation about what they should do next, yeah, that shows some growth in him. I think was was pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah. matches the <clears throat> matches the development of the town. It's the continuation and that sort of idea about like we because we've been talking about why don't they just kill Hurst and they they discuss right, it in right. this episode. So yeah, I find Tolliver Tolliver's stuff. I, <laughs> I, I find it very repetitive, but I kind of enjoy it because the repetition of it is almost kind of charming um, because every single piece of information he has, if I feel like he reacts as though he has the secrets to the nuclear codes or something. Mm-hmm. And so he always, every scene is him laying it out. He's like, well, if I were to tell you exactly what I know, then then you would know it as well. And that would be worth nothing to me unless you gave me something. For, it's like, dude, what the fuck do you want? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's every tiny little bit of information he reacts in, in the same way where he's like the cat who caught the canary. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. warranted, sometimes not. Um, <clears throat> but I think... It's just, it's, I feel like his scenes are all kind of running together for me because they are so similar that way this season. Yeah. Um, Not that it's bad. It's just, it's Powers Booth doing his, at his boothiest, doing yeah. his thing. I mean, I mean, one of the, one of the criticisms of uh, the show at this point, which makes it interesting that you liked, um, uh, like uh, Odell's uh, entrance in this episode is that um, 
certainly some of the main cast aren't in this episode. Like Jane, yeah. uh, Joni's only in it at the end. Yeah, There's Joni. A- jo- I, I actually, I was thinking, I was like, man, they, they've really shoved Joni to the side, and then she shows up for 30 seconds at the end and, yep. and doesn't really help help my case or help her case. Yeah, I, well, I, I think that that scene's very good, and it's very important. It is. It's a good scene. Yeah. It, it's tough to... Like, Wu is not in this one. Cochran, Doc Cochran, is not mm-hmm. in this episode at all. Uh, the show is definitely bursting at the seams with characters, and I think one of the criticisms at this point is that some, like, some of the reviews that I read don't like the entrance of Odell uh, because it's kind of taking away from the main cast at it, this point. It is. So I'm curious to see what happens with this plot line because to drop something like this... Well, it's weird, right? Because this show, it's not like this show doesn't do this stuff all the time. Right. But um, <clears throat> to drop in something like this at the halfway point of a season that has a pretty clear drive to it is a little bit um, unusual. Yeah. But uh, I I think the thing that made me so intrigued by it <clears throat> was there was, I don't know if they've ever really played something so secretive, like so boldly uh, or baldly secretive as they they do here where there's something going on there's some something that his mother doesn't want him to do or to some reason he doesn't she doesn't want him to talk to Hearst um <clears throat> and it's just like the most flatly f- flat out like television style intrigue that I feel like the show has done in a long time okay I invite you now to sit down with him to eat Sit across from me and have dinner, Odell. That before you said go. Fires in his eyes. You was any place indoors at all. Gold seemed to change his mind. Don't you want to say yes, ma'am, or yes, mama, or for that, or after, Odell? So my heart feels how sweet you are. No, ma'am. Make me know you sweet. God-fearing and truthful like I wanted my boy to be. Back from where you send him, raising up to a man, safe and amongst his own. Liberia, free. Free? Shit. Don't you speak to me that way. What way, mama? Use language like that to me. No kind of truth. Yes, man. Liberia, free. Praise Jesus. Here come the spirit over me. Don't you take him in vain. Don't you dare to do it. All right, Mama. All right. What was the truth of it then? Liberia? No field work. African niggas for that. Now, they lazy and stupid, Mama. American niggas steal off the African till the English cheat us out of it. Hot till you can't breathe. Nothing ever be dry. Hate the air. Hate the breathing in and out. Liberia. I like I like the Odell storyline. Um, I yeah. like his introduction. I I think that it's just a. You know, it's it's the same it's the same problem that I have, which is that. Um, well, it started at the top. I. Uh, I was watching this one and I really liked this episode and mm. I think that I like a lot of the third season episodes. And then I was looking at some of the reviews and the, uh, the people weren't as positive on this one thing that was kind of like a, maybe a necessary foot off the gas pedal after the last episode and kind of a reset type thing. Yeah. But I, I have a hard time. I have a, I have a hard time with the show. Like, so like, cause a lot of it is the uh, the way that we watch shows and what we talk about with the podcast and stuff. Like a lot of the time, my day to day is that I sort of forget that I have to like watch something and then do the recording for it. So whenever mm-hmm. I remember that I have to watch something, I usually get like a little bit annoyed that I like I it, because it's being forced on me. I have to watch it and like I have to sit down and do it, and I, I don't really have a recourse not to do that. I feel that particularly because we're in like a dull stretch of Voyager and everything. Um, and it sometimes feels a little bit like work. And I always feel uh, triggered that way in that like, I'm like, oh, I got to watch the Deadwood. It's like I, I wanted to do something else, but I have to sit down and do this. And I do it. 
and I wanted to play Red Dead Redemption <laughs> 2, but I got to watch Deadwood, I guess. <laughs> I wanted to watch I wanted to continue my my John Wayne uh, filmography tour, but instead I have to watch <laughs> this totally random thing. And but whenever I put on Deadwood and I sit down, I never remember why I was upset that I had to watch it in the first right, place. Like yeah. so I, I really enjoy it and I really enjoyed this episode. Uh and in in just the it's a long way to go to say like I I can understand some criticisms of the show, but I I I viscerally feel none of them at the same time. Like I mm-hmm. I can understand that the plots are overloaded and the characters can't really do things. One of the shows brings up a fact um that narratively Leon's monologue and his whole scene with Alma where he then gets um accosted by Trixie with the gun where she tells him to mm-hmm. stop talking to Alma. All of that is narratively unnecessary because Hearst and Sai have already decided not to do that plot with Alma. Mm. So there's this like incredible bursting at the seams redundancy to some of the Deadwood episodes, which is probably a byproduct of the, of the production process at this point. That like they're really just not, not sure what the, what's going on down the future, and they're they're being a little re- bit redundant, and they don't have like the leanest of plots in place. But at the same time. The scene where Leon is talking to his mud puddle reflection mm-hmm, is like mm-hmm. is like, God damn it. Like this is such a it's such a great show with so many characters who are even little bit players like Leon gets this moment to shine where you get this like sense of this guy as he's talking yeah. to himself in the puddle. And it's just full of scenes like that where it's like I, I don't even really have a criticism that I care about but in, in terms of how the plot is shaking out or where things are going or like how redundant some of the scenes seem because on this rewatch, I'm definitely noticing a lot of character redundancies that I think that like they, they don't really know what to do with the characters. They come back to the main point of what that character mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I just, I watch the show. I have a, a big smile and like the dialogue here is fantastic. This is all very fun and I'm enjoying the introduction of Odell because I think that the Odell storyline is uh, fantastic. And to throw it back to you, I would, my thing about the Odell storyline is that I actually, on rewatch, and this is definitely being comfortable with the material. I think they, I think they explain everything in this episode that's going on with Odell. It's just not overtly explained what's going on. Um, oh, in- interesting. So I was paying attention because I wasn't sure because I had your similar idea that I was like, I, I wonder how long it's going to take before they reveal what's going on. Him and his mother, they're seen together where she's getting upset, saying like when he says that he wants to talk to Hearst. Mm-hmm. that pretty much breaks everything down, which is that he's come back to run a con on Hearst. And it's what and okay. it's what the general says after he talks to Odell at the bar, which is that he can't convince him otherwise and he's out to hurt. And because of the pain that he feels from his mother sending him away to a Liberia, he's going to take out that hurt on Hearst, who he thinks represents I, the badness of what was done to him. I had a feeling that's what it was. <clears throat> As soon as he said, I found gold in Liberia, I was like, uh, that doesn't seem real. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I was like, this guy can't be this dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we haven't really gotten to it. So we don't know his actual plot yet. But sure. I, I think it's sure. clear that he's up to no good. And his mother senses that he's up to no good, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I... I, I uh, I, I just thought it was very um, – the way that they depicted it was very interesting and very intriguing. Uh, mainly, I think the mother does a lot of the heavy lifting because Odell himself doesn't really do much uh, or give you a ton. But her reaction of the uh, hiding the money and the way that she is around Hearst and even the way that Hearst greets him, I mean, he's, he's still uh, running on – hot coals because of everything that happened the day before with uh captain you mean hearst Marvel. hearst is still upset about everything yes yeah, yeah. yeah so the way that he comes in and is kind of pissy that she let him into the hotel or whatever into is, a room yeah yeah i'm sure is is a is a hangover from the stuff with uh captain morgan there whatever yep. his name is turner yeah <laughs> turner <clears throat> dan's um, the one dealing with the captain morgan uh to get through yeah. his pain um but yeah, I thought that was still, I I love that scene with Leon in the puddle. Yeah, that was yeah. probably my favorite episode, favorite scene of the episode because it's it's um, it's a great little scene for him, 
uh, and yeah, I, I think the, what the show does really well is it is it is it finds the pockets to give these side characters like one really good scene, which really sort of justifies their presence in the show. Yeah, um, because up until now he's kind of been like a like a plot filler. Where like if they need to string some things along, well, have Leon run some information between you know that. Kind yeah, of thing. he's he's like the the intermediary, the the go between to get things done is really his role as a character. Yeah, and uh, just giving these great character actors one scene to really let a rip um, makes it all work and feel of a piece and of a of really of a community um, in a way that a lot of shows tend not to do I, I like that leon's leon's conflict is not a moral dilemma either really it's that he doesn't want to get killed after he kills all right is it right, right. so he's, he has a he has a selfish uh self-preservation instinct that's going on which is why he's so so nervous and terrified about it but his relief when he sort of steps away from it and he doesn't have to do it is very palpable uh, palpable i I do I do find it funny though how sometimes the um the dense loquaciousness of this show or the characters themselves gets in the way of just talking to other people. Yeah. Because yeah. the way that he comes in hot with Alma and everything he sells to, says to Alma he never says um you know they're going to kill you. You should probably stop taking dope. <laughs> <laughs> he strongly he says, hints at it. He's, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he strongly hits, hints at it in the most obtuse way possible. Yeah. But yeah. he never comes out and says what the, uh, what the concern actually is, yeah. um, which I always find funny. One of the, one of the, Deadwood, uh, the, the, the Deadwood Bible, which is the book that I read as like a companion piece to this, the reviews are written by... Uh, Matt Zoller seats and he has a thing here that I thought was kind of interesting which is that um, the aftermath is believably messy and psychologically perceptive even if there are some scenes where you may wonder if Milch and the company aren't getting too deep in the weeds of language and intent to the point where the players and characters spend more time deciphering each other than taking action against each other there's a lot of verbal tea leaf reading in a rich find focusing mainly on intentions, tactics, and timings in the manners and protocols of the day. So his example would be like Al's yeah. concern about things. And then uh, Hearst is, Hearst's obsession with manners, like sort of what the scene you were talking about where he gets pissy about Odell being invited into what he views as his apart, his hotel without his permission. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of, I think that's why people might find the episode to be unsatisfying is because it's it's basically a recovery episode after pissing off Hearst in the last one and it's mm -hmm. characters trying to figure out what to do and it's a lot of sitting around saying what should we do what are you going to do and how do we get out of this in a way that saves face for everybody and I, I find it because I think the show excels in those moments more than the action moments so I, I, mm -hmm. I like this kind of stuff and I always I, I just like this episode because of all the um it's just got a whole bunch of scenes between characters that I think are really interesting. Yeah, I, I think uh, the the denseness of the language I, I found it, it's it's gotten to the point where in certain places it has developed its own language based on the show itself. Sure, that can be a little bit tough to crack. Like the scene where Charlie kind of where it's uh, um, Seth and Saul, Saul and Charlie and Charlie, and Charlie kind of has his little monologue there. He uses a phrase that took me a second to register what he was saying, where he says something to the effect of uh, Hearst is going to take us to Bill. Yeah. And I realized, oh, he's talking about Wild Bill in that Wild Bill is dead. And he was, they are going, he, Hearst is going to make them dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's a very clever way to say it, but that's a very inside the dictionary of the show mm -hmm. way to say Hearst is going to kill us. I did appreciate it. That was a very uh, um, um, Shakespearean type monologue where he gets that moment. Um, that's always fun in the Shakespeare monologues where someone is like, and then I turned and I showed my ass to him. Yeah. <laughs> do you bite, do you bite your thumb at me, sir? Yes, I bite my I thumb. Bite my thumb. Um, the, but but the, I, the I bill, appreciated that one. I appreciated that one a lot because about halfway through it, he just says, Hurst is coming. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. got it. One thing, if he knew it was coming, 
Bill was not shy of drawing first. Seth locked up Hearst instead of that. Or oh, I guess. What, what does that mean? It means, Mr. Starr, after leading him by the year through camp for all to fucking see, Seth installs Hearst in a cell adjoining a man he's had killed, that the knife still protrudes out his chest. And much as me and Hearst conversed, I made him address my ass. So do less, don't pretend. Hearst will feel he was treated legal or, or, or civilized, or that his business with us is finished. Hearst is fucking coming, bringing us back to Bill and doing unto others first, which ought maybe include a, a, a visit to Hearst's fucking diggings. And his muscle you fail to murder before they rouse. You bring to chase you to camp. Judas goat to cocksuckers. For Swanjin's men and Talibas to mow down from fucking ambush. While we're up seeing to Hearst. There'll be nothing left of the camp. <laughs> How much you figure will stand once Hearst had his fucking say? I think because I, I also I think there's additional meaning to that. I that it is that their death is imminent, just like Bill. It's also a callback to because what they're talking about that at that point is bringing the fight to Hearst. Because that's Charlie. Mm-hmm. That's when Charlie Hatch is the whole idea of like we'll you know we'll lure Hearst down here and someone will distract his muscle and shoot him and while Hearst is over here, someone will stab him. So it's this plot against Hearst, but it's also bringing it back to Bill thematically ties into the reason that they can't do anything against Hearst at this point is because they're no longer in the Wild Bill, Wild West era of the show, right? So mm-hmm. the, the reason Hearst is allowed is because in their quest to have Deadwood become a civilized society that gets absorbed into the larger United States and becomes this thing, part of the part of the, the deal with the devil of that happening is that people like Hearst are allowed into the camp at that point. So, Well, you know... What I find interesting about that, though, right, is like, I guess Swearingen and some of the other people are taking that mindset, but Hearst isn't. No. Hearst is still killing people and leaving them in the middle of the street with knives sticking out of their chests and shit. You know, there's why why is it why is it more civilized to let Hearst do that than to just go like, oh yeah, I don't know what happened. He just slipped fell and his uh, pistol went into his mouth and blew his brains out. I think it's just because, well, I mean, obviously I said like the symbolism of Hearst has the money and therefore Hearst has the power to do Mm -hmm. what he wants in the town. Then you get the women. Then you get the sugar. (laughs) So (laughs) I I think that that covers the Hearst base for me. And for me, yeah. it's, it's always more of a thematic thing because like, Oh, of course, of course the, I know it's yeah. the, the show makes no effort to Hearst has no guards at this point, you know, like there's, mm-hmm. there's no one protecting him, but it's just supposed to be that he represents something larger than that. I, I, because I, I, I would have agree, agreed with you if to this point, because this episode I think is kind of important in that the characters are now voicing this opinion about what if we just kill him and do right. something like that. I, I think that the the reason not to is kind of hidden or it's it's made subtextual through the scenes that involve her sending his telegram in this episode, which has that really awesome scene of um, American Blazanov where Blazanov has clearly read the telegram and is upset right. about it. Yeah, yeah, I like that scene a lot. And so I think it's implicit in that. It's it's like Hearst is wealthy enough that killing him almost certainly ensures that the town is burns to the ground or returns to the forest is the metaphor right. that they use in yeah. this episode because Hearst has a plan in place for if he were to die in this in this town, something bad seems likely to happen at that point. So I, I imagine it's that way. It's more the like the civilization thing that's holding them back is more about... um as society develops, there are people who abuse the rules and like have this undue power in them just as we do now, but there's still a, uh, there's still these like bounds of society that you can no longer go to. And the, the Charlie line is this, and this is that you're just not, you can't go back to the time of wild bill where you can preemptively kill people because you think yeah, they're going to cause yes. you a problem. Yeah. At least not until 1963. That's <laughs> a certain day, in November. 
in Dallas. In Dallas. Anyway. <laughs> um, back, back, <clears throat> back into the left. Back into the left. Uh, yeah, you know, it's the same reason why I, I get, I get, I, I, I hate it when people are like, well, you know, Batman could do more uh, uh, good for the t- the city if he just gave away all of his money. It's yeah, like, yeah, oh, sh- <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Sets up a nonprofit instead of yeah, Wayne uh, uh, Enterprises. Uh, sure, objectively, in a real world sense, yes, but. That's not the story that we're telling here. Yeah. yeah. No, I kept, and that's the, I think that's the tough spot where Deadwood occupies, really, yeah. is that the, the show isn't super concerned about the plot mechanics of why Hearst is still alive or why this hasn't been brought up before this. Yeah. It just is the way that it is. And it's going right. to end with yeah. this. The characters recognizing that rather than go and shoot him, they have to talk about it with the other characters on the show to figure out a solution. And that that stuff is I, I always find that that sort of analysis, if you want to call it that, very reductive of whatever it is your the media is that you're taking in. <clears throat> Cause it's like, is that really what you're getting out of this? Is like, well, this would all be over so much faster if they just shot the guy. It's like right. well, <laughs> True for okay, true great. for a lot of situations, I guess, in real life too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But like, you know, it's why are you watching the show? Yeah. Right at right. that point, yep. if that's if that's what your thought process is, <clears throat> agreed, agreed. I th- I think that yeah, it's it's a it's a show that's just built for like I think one of the, the the one of the strengths around it comes down to that thing of the characters are I, what I think Milch does a really good job of is. The characters are both a strong representation of an idea, but also characters too at that point. Mm-hmm. So like I, I think Hearst is probably the best example of it. I I don't think I've praised the character enough. I've said that he's one of my favorite antagonists, but I, I like I you, you you mention it every episode. Stephen <laughs> Stephen Wall <laughs> Stephen Wall wrote that, you know, it's the role of a lifetime for McRaney and mm-hmm. I think it is. I, I I can't find. I find the character to be absurdly interesting and just such a good character that represents, you know, all the ills of everything that the money and the capital can represent that's coming into the town, but also that he's not just this like cliched villain type character. Yeah. Like I, I think one of the the strongest things about that is that he he seems genuinely sad about Captain Turner being killed, which is really yeah. interesting to me because yeah. he doesn't seem from his setup that he should care about Captain Turner in a in another show he would just have a new Captain Turner this episode, right? Like a new right, guy would appear yeah. and he'd be like you're my you're my new henchman. And Yeah, Leon right, a bulked up Leon, a roided up Leon just uh, standing next to him. Or Richardson maybe. Richardson, based yeah. On, based on that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you're stupid aren't you yes sir yes sir but that and that's you know that scene's great because richardson is one of the few characters that hearst doesn't despise in this town because mm-hmm. he knows his kind of place and it's subservient to hearst and things like that but i think you just get you get a lot of angles of hearst in this episode where he is he's furious about what happened to him he can be the powerful guy who's going to be pulling strings He's incredibly insecure in other scenes about what's going on and how embarrassed he is and things like that. He has this weird semi-racist thing, but his racism ebbs if he's told information about gold that he finds interesting and things like that. Like he's mm-hmm. he's just really nuanced and in a way that he feels like a full full fledged character, like a full person. Oh, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? That's all. Yeah. I recall my instructions to you as being that any time you and I meet, swear engines to be represented. Heard and understood, Mr. Hurst, and I hope correctly honored in the breach in this one single instance. Make your case. Not to read your mind. It seemed your idea for swear engine and me had to do with this newer phase we're moving into, camps, official business and the like. Swear engine and me unofficially see into your interests. Because the small-mindedness and self-interested behavior that's so pervasive in this shithole makes impossible my efficient attention to the requirements of my operation. Well, I can only imagine what that's like, sir. Man who's accomplished what you have, having to move among the low-rent cocksuckers and short-hauls. Make your fucking case why you've gone against my instructions. 
I'll come into a certain piece of knowledge, sir, that could make this more or less a fucking company town. And my thinking was, if communicating this privately to Mr. Hurst risks putting me and Al Swearinger in the fuck out of action as middlemen, so the fuck be it. Suppose I could put the Ellsworth claim into play for you, Mr. Hurst. How? The ladies re-involved herself with a habit turns a person's life upside down. One of my own fucking employee supplies here, God help me, and that's a habit, sir. Makes a person subject to accident and mischance of every fucking sort, having to do especially with the ups and downs of the fucking quality of the fucking shit she's being given. I wish I'd heard this yesterday. <laughs> I'll confide that one to honor your instructions to the letter cost me 24 hours before approaching you. If I had, my instructions would have had to do with bringing the inevitable about. In the interval, I have suffered certain losses. Oh, rest fucking Captain Turner, so. I'd be quiet now, Mr. Tolliver, if I were you. losses and indignities which despite the strong impulse of my nature towards simplicity prompt me to a different approach do you enjoy that sir no i don't you don't enjoy that i don't no and i wish you'd cut it the fuck out i not only spent last night incarcerated i was taken to jail by the ear a uh, fucking maniac sheriff by our maniac sheriff that's correct and had as a cellmate, or to be fair in describing my situation, cohabitated with in the adjacent cell a rotting corpse, whom it was the deputy's pleasure this morning to accuse me of having murdered. I'm therefore distressed and angry, and I seem for the moment to be taking this out on your ear. But in the longer term, my intentions are other and more complicated. Can we pretend the longer time's arrived, sir? I'd have you release me for a fucking fact. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I never got the best of me. Don't give it another thought. Yeah, no, he's great. I mean <laughs> I you know, I'm I'm sure when it comes down to it. Uh, what's his name? McRaney, the actor. Yeah, Gerald McRaney. Gerald McRaney. I'm sure he's gonna say, you know, Major Dad was really the peak of my <laughs> my career. That one brings in the residuals, I would assume. It does. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, where does, does that exist on on anywhere anymore? I don't know. It's 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 it's, it's up it's after probably, hanging with Mr. Hooper. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably on. So it's probably on like. 2B4 or something yeah. like that. Like the, <laughs> the, the fourth TV. iteration. One of those one of those bad free TV. Yeah, on the Roku, things. the channel that yeah, just downloads the, yeah, itself the Roku, to Roku. It's, it's the Roku channel, yeah. <laughs> but and which means he's probably not getting residuals from it. Uh, well, which is why he's on strike currently, or at least comfortably watching the strike from his house. It's ending. The writers got their agreement. Now they, the actors, yeah, they did, yeah. but the actors actors yeah. are still fighting. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know as an actor how you could want more than, than that character, honestly, cause it's, it's just, it's got pretty much everything in it. Um, as a, as a, as a villain, it, I, I think what's one of the things that's so great about him is he is so different than the other, uh, for lack of a better term, antagonists in the show. Yeah. I think he's much different than Hurst. Sorry, I think he's much different than Al. I think he's much different than Tolliver. I think he's much different than um, you know, if Walcott you want to call Walcott. Yeah, yeah. He's just got a different vibe that is so much more. Um, he's got a lot of uh, uh, depth to him, and so much of it is not stuff that he's. What am I trying to say? It's the acting. Yeah, the right. It's he's the a writing, perfect casting. But it's, the, guy, yes, the guys, it's, he's great as the cast. It's the writing, obviously, but it's the acting that really gets it to you. Because again, a million times I've said this, a million times before, the thing is, this show is acted so well because, or, or it, the show is acted so well, which gives you information that you need that's not the stuff that people are saying. Yeah, which is, you know, I, f I feel like it's more and more rare with a lot of these shows. Yeah, I, I find it in you know. 
Cy Tolliver and his scenes with his underlings and when he beat Kristen Bell to death and killed mm-hmm. her boyfriend. Like Cy Tolliver is a ter- terrifying character, right? A terrible person, terrifying, very scary. Hurst twists his ear and turns him into a school child in this. You know, there's, there's a... Right, yeah. There is... Tolliver is nothing in the face of this. He's Because of the ascendancy of Hurst, Tolliver has just become this sort of like glorified Leon character, really. Like there's yeah. no... There's nothing else for him to do except try to get on the good graces of Hearst to end up on the winning side is, is basically Tolliver's plan at this point. Well, I think if you compare the two of them using that exact instance with, with Kristen Bell, uh, who who is the who does uh Tolliver assert his his power and his and his iron fist over? It's mostly uh women yeah. who are bit, less powerful um, than him less basically. powerful yeah. or drug addicts or other other people who are lesser than him yeah and, and he so he'll put up put on a big show and make a big show of shooting Kristen bell in the head but uh hearst will do that to al fucking swearingen and right. not even yeah. blink you know like i think that's the difference is that hearst hearst can pull that shit on people who are believe themselves to be powerful where Tolliver only does it on people who know that they're weak. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And it, it puts Tolliver in his place. <laughs> I, I like Tolliver. He's like, I'd wish you'd fucking stop. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, he's always, I feel like he, he just always keeps waiting to have like the one bit of info that's going to put him over somebody else some yeah. of these other people and Hearst specifically is like none you, nothing you do could affect me any less than what you've just told yeah, me yeah it, it's the you know it's the what the seats review said which is talking about protocol a lot of that scene is Tolliver just going like well with our new arrangement you told me you didn't want me to talk about right. it. it's like <laughs> it's, and, and Hearst is very upset about that uh because he feels that he should have been told immediately but it's really well, just Tolliver spinning his wheels because he doesn't know what to do it's funny too because like that's imagine that scene with Al and Johnny. It's a very similar kind of scene, mm-hmm. or maybe even E B. Yeah, where E B. They kind of have a scene like that with E B. Like, but imagine that being E B and Al, where E B says, "You know, I, I had a piece of information, but you said right under the current thing, I shouldn't <laughs> talk to you unless <laughs> it, I found it was intent." And, just, and him just like, "Would you just spit it out?" Right. You know, yeah. it's very similar kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's- <laughs> great great eb episode like uh, for yes. for being on the, yeah, the on the on the on the sidelines for the for a lot of this season they give him a couple really good scenes yeah the scene where he 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 gives um what's what's her what's the character the the on lou odell's mother on lou. lou yeah where he gives on lou the directions and then waits until she's well out the door for him to be a racist dick about it yep, it's yep. just what does he Perfect. say? He's like, I, I, I imagine you I would have, wouldn't know right from left or yeah, something. Yeah, I would have spoken, but I didn't think you knew the difference <laughs> right. between left and right. <laughs> but he, I like it because the, the acting, he doesn't even look up from his like ledger or whatever he's writing. Right, he just yeah. mutters it to himself under his breath. Yeah. The thing I was I couldn't quite track, though, was why did he think Tolliver giving him the money was a test from Al? I don't think there's any good reason. I think it's just yeah. to get him to talk to Al. Because when okay. he when he goes into the office, I was similarly similarly unsure of why he even went over there in the first place. Because I feel like even Al is sort of not really sure why he's no, there. No, he, he does. <laughs> <laughs> it just needs an excuse to go over and uh, talk to him. No, I'm I'm. I guess it's because E. B. sees Al and Tolliver talking with Hearst as a threesome thing mm-hmm. you know like he he's seen that oh, so sure. maybe he's assuming that it means something or that he's trying to be played by Tolliver to get one over on Al something like that mm-hmm. um I'm just looking at the list of quotes now they're funny what is the um her says I am therefore distressed and angry and I seem to be at the moment taking this out on your fucking ear <laughs> which is good um EB has the thwart that abysian abys- uh, abysian uh, line which is very funny yeah I think it's you know, you get on the racist angle. You get um, further characterization of Steve here. I like the scene where Steve, Steve is out in the street begging, trying to justify to himself that he's not responsible for Hostetler's death, and everyone ignoring yeah, him. Yeah, that was really good. Steve is turning into 
Drunk Uncle, the yes. Saturday Night yeah. Live character. Yeah. <laughs> Who does that? That's um uh Bobby Moynihan. Bobby Moynihan, yeah. Yeah. You haven't seen that that um documentary on HBO called Telemarketers, have you? No. It's it's pretty good. It's you'll never pick up your phone ever again oh, uh, sure. after you watch it. But the the guy at the middle at the center of it is this like re- recovered heroin addict who worked for 20 years in a call center it is just like one of the strangest most eccentric people you'll ever see at the center of a documentary right and he's he's basically a bobby moynihan character he's basically drunk uncle it's very it's very yeah. he even looks he looks a lot like him too yeah. it's very funny <laughs> yeah he's steve is um he's he's kind of played for comedy in this one. Oh, it definitely uh, is yeah, yeah he's i mean because he's he's pathetic at this point but like his his <laughs> Is his uh, like wide eyed when another black man enters the town and, he, yes. and they both show up in the same bar and he's outnumbered and he's he, he gets very nervous and stands at the end of the bar. But yeah, it's Steve's sort of being uh, abandoned because Tom Nuttall uh, has that thing where he moves to the other side of the bar just to be further away from him, things like that. Well, they get they have the the perfect the perfect thing for him in this because it's the thing where I it's. It's I, we talked about it previously with him where, you know, there's always the person who's like, you know, the one thing I can't stand in my life is drama is the person who is always the drama magnet. Yep. And they have he has that great line where he's uh, uh, chewing out Tom and he ends it with where he says, look inward. Why don't you before blaming the other yes, person? Yeah, he's completely unaware of himself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's just a guy, a guy who can't can't get out of his own way. No, no, sorry, Steve, but yeah, I, I looked his. Um, I think the, the Haney as the actor is great. I, I do like the scene where he is just sort of like trying to convince people that he's not responsible and he doesn't bear any uh, um, responsibility for Hostel or even though he, he deeply uh, feels different than that. Don't you? Heart. Don't you wish people would give pre- press conferences like this nowadays? I feel like every time they show a scene like this from a, a move uh, a story that takes place in the 1800s there, there's always such more of a performative aspect to it where he where it's like it was then that i came upon the man right to see yeah. that he had so unfortunately fallen and <laughs> eaten the barrel of his own gun <laughs> where don't you wish like any of the press conferences that politicians give or people who are trying to cover for something stupid that they did gave it and that's yeah of i way. know that that would kind of like that voice. one guy yeah that one senate guy who just got they found out that he's been like hoarding money and giving it to Egypt or whatever that. Yes, he's is. got. What is it? The senator from Jersey. Yeah, I saw some. Cl- I heard some clip of him where he's like, "Well, it's, it's you'll everyone will see that that's money that I made and came from my own bank account." Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Whatever, pal. But like, I <laughs> imagine if if he was more like. To be in such a position in which I were to take this money, right. I would have had to have been had this. Dumped upon me tenfold. It's like, all right, let's <laughs> sure, let's do it. <laughs> He's speaking in such a way that I find convincing, and I yeah, think that I have exactly. to I have to, I have to go with him. No, it they, was they then that it. the gold bars fell into my own pocket, unbeknownst <laughs> to my own person, who was at the time preoccupied with the buttocks of a young woman. He he would be he he would have been Menendez. I think it's the senator's name is like Menendez or something. Menendez, yes, yeah. Uh, but he would have he hey. should have used. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, whatever he does, still uh, number three worst Menendez. Yeah, he's <laughs> I guess it, I guess it depends how far reaching his uh, his, That's his true. Imp- impact is. But That's yeah. true. De- destabilizing a, a Middle Eastern country, <laughs> arguably worse than double, you know, parent, parental homicide. Not sure. I'm gonna. Uh, um, what's the? God damn it! I don't, I don't want to have to do the edit on the show, but there's the. I imagine that senator talking to his wife, and it's the quote from Brom in season one, where he's like, "Alma, when I return, it won't be bags of gold weighing me down, but it'll be <laughs> <laughs> whatever Brom says in that scene is what the senator needs to say to his wife, who's in on the con." Uh, let's see. Talked about Hearst. Talked about all that stuff. So, I mean, what do you? You can kind of we can tie it up in a bow with the Odell and the Hearst. Uh, stuff like I one one of my favorite I think that uh, the actress who plays Aunt Lou I think her name is Cleo King um, I think she's very good mostly because of the way she modulates between 
uh, the different kinds of voices that she uses when she's speaking mm-hmm. to different people. Like she talks to Hearst in a very different way than she talks to Odell in the way that she talks to uh, the other black characters who are on the show. I thought that scene with uh, when Hearst find, comes in to see her and her son for the first time, I thought she was really, really good in that scene. Which because she's, she's tra- nervous, right? Yeah, because she's trying to keep that s- certain up energy that she has with Hearst, but she's also really nervous about everything. So it's yep. kind of like somewhere in the middle is good, really yeah. good. Yeah. Liberia. He mind me here for his say so? How's he going to mind you come see your mother? He in your room. He give me this room. You stay here, Aunt Lou. Who says what? No goddamn never mind to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, then. Well, well, well. You've got me in your room, ain't Lou? My boy, Mr. Hayes. My boy, Odell. Your boy. How do you do, Odell? How do you do, sir? Where you been, Mr. Hayes? Let me fix you up some breakfast. You made yourself at home, Odell. You're in the room I set aside, mother. I asked him in, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that was me asked him in. Well, now that your mama's invited you in, I suppose we might say on spur of the moment, I hope that you'll accept my invitation as well as the hotel's owner and your mother's employer. Please, Odell, won't you stay? I will, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness. Not hungry just now, ain't Lou? You know know what this show is showing me? Mm Mm-hmm. There are a lot of good actors out there who yeah. just don't get anything to work with. You know, like, it, I, I don't know who this woman is. I've never seen her in anything else. She's really, she's great. Yeah. And it's, I think it's just, it's that she is a great actress with great material. Right. And it's like, there's so many people out there in so many shows that are not rising to the level of anybody in this show. And I have to imagine it's just because... The, the content is not the yeah, stuff just, that they're being just tasked the material. to do. Yeah. Is, the material is yeah. not not good. Yeah, because we've uh, on the Discord people put clips of you know Sanderson and things that are not this, and a mm. lot of it you know it's a lot of it's out of context, so you don't really understand what's going on. And genres are different, and shows are different, and things like that. But it's just a there is a, a perfect melding that has to happen. Um, between the character and the material, I think. And this show yeah. was, was good at it. Um, I, I find it so fascinating when you... How that can happen and how it can go the other way. Like the... the you know, I feel like actors don't get pigeonholed quite as much as they used to in the you know previous century, which is, feels weird to say. Yeah, they don't have long, <coughs> long enough running shows, I don't think. Yeah, to get well, I mean, even way. what I was thinking of is in... Um, the fur in the the Bell Lugosi Dracula movie, the guy who plays Renfield, yep, uh, Dwight Fry was like a pretty. I think he was a, like a pretty well known Broadway actor at the time, yeah, and was well regarded as like a great actor. And in that movie, he puts in a fucking phenomenal performance to the to the point where he's essentially a, a legendary character at yeah. this point. But after that movie he couldn't get work really doing anything other than that. And it's, it's just so weird to go from like this guy, you got a great actor and you've, you've just, he's relegated to like, yes, Dr. Pretorius. That's why (laughs) we need to find the bodies before the sun goes down. You know? Yeah. Do you, I mean, but we watched a lot of, uh, he's also in Frankenstein. Good in that one too. We watched a lot of, uh, old Star Trek because the old Star Trek shows, right? Have Mm -hmm. there, are there now more good actors, or what happened? Because Star Trek used to not be able to get a guest actor who could act, right? Like it was just there was a there's I a fifty percent coin toss that your actor is going to be bad in the guest role. Yeah, I think the big the big difference is that TV used to be uh, looked down upon. You okay, know? Like so I, they all went I, to I, film I, instead of television acting, and and not, yeah, I think yeah. it was, I, you know, I th- I think a lot, uh, well depends on the star trek show but i so i interesting interesting example to use right because sometimes you'll get star trek shows with guest actors who are just terrible and and what they're asked to do or is not really that great but on the other hand sometimes you get harris yulin 
yes. playing a Cardassian in jail talking yep. about his terrorist past. Yep. And it's fantastic. And so it's it really, I think it just comes down to the quality of the material. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a certain alchemy that... But yeah, the, yeah. Material and actor, but, you know. Yeah, I just, I'm... Even, I'm trying even, to think of an example on Star Trek where it's some like objectively great actor who had just just tanked it on, who, on Star Trek. Uh, Padme Lash Lashkme, whatever the the top chef <laughs> lady in her enterprise. <laughs> oh yes, objection, <laughs> objective great, objective great actor. Yeah. She she kills it in every Top Chef episode, but not in this Star Trek episode. Uh, who is a good like who's been a good actor on? Uh, I'm just thinking of like Mick Fleetwood. He didn't say anything. He's not a great actor. <laughs> I'll come up with one. We'll have one by mm-hmm. the end of the episode. But I, I, I would just be surprised because even even if you were looking down your nose at television back in 1988, you'd still think there's enough struggling great actors who are like, I need a paycheck and I'm willing to work on this sure. show. You know, sure. Yeah. yeah so hey, that's how we got Captain John Luke Picard. <laughs> that's, that's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was the he was the one that changed everything. Um. Alma and Ellsworth have a little bit of a scene. Mm. Ellsworth continue. Ellsworth threatens to leave, or he says he's going to leave. It's been a continuation off of their previous episode. I that was a really interesting scene because Ellsworth's. I I'm not really sure what to believe in that scene mm-hmm. because Alma, of course, is trying to patch things up, being like, "No, I really do care for you." And Ellsworth's response is actually, it's weirdly mature, but also not if that makes sense because he's like no i think if i'm not here if i'm here nothing is going to improve and if i'm not here you'll have more of a uh reason to get clean and i'm like yeah "Ah, ooh, i understand the thinking i don't know if it works like that but i i understand the thought yeah yeah no i think he's um he's he's it's another sort of quality thing of the writing that a lot of characters do which is that their motivation is not entirely pure about what they're doing and so there's a mm-hmm. nice blend of um selfishness and concern on the other hand for things it and even so like again it's 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 a refreshing way to handle that scene instead of ellsworth being like I don't want to handle this. You're a mess. Right. You know, <laughs> you where it's like in, up. instead he comes up with a rational, uh, uh, an excuse. I'm, I'm, I'm doing nothing but speculating here, but yep. he comes up with an excuse that is, r- seems rational to him and allows him to be like, you know what? I don't want to deal with this shit. Yeah. Yep. Whether or not that's the honorable thing to do. I don't know. It's, it's tough when, when you deal with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's pretty much the extent of their scene. Uh, Trixie gets fired from the bank is the other aspect. That's a, mm-hmm. um, I think the Trixie talking to Al is a great example of I like, where I like that scene. Yeah, where this show is a little bit different too. I think, I think most shows use that as a springboard for Trixie goes back to working at the gym. You know, it, it's like it brings yeah. her back into the fold of what was working before, and the show won't let that happen. Well, it's it's I I think it's. You know, the show gets so dense with the way that they talk about stuff that I feel like, you know, kind of like what I said with the Charlie Utter scene, it is so refreshing isn't the right word, but it lands so heavily when someone just comes out and says something. Sure. Straight ahead. Instead of, yeah. Instead of, yeah, instead of dancing around it. And so in that scene with Trixie and Al where, you know, she's like, ah, I thought about turning a trick. And then he gives her kind of the Deadwood answer and then she says it again. And then he just straight up says... I hate it when people don't recognize when they've had things better yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah, the line exact yes, line yeah, is. But it's like yeah. when he says that, it's like, oh shit! All right, yeah, that's not something I usually would expect Al to say. Yeah, yeah, no, he's especially he's with her. Yeah, I think he's you know, their relationship is kind of a nice little subtle touch where they they've yeah. gone through all the phases of their relationship and to this point, it's they've moved on from each other and they now view each other as. Um, Maybe friends would be the right way, like supportive of each other. But Al mm-hmm. is unwilling to let her come back to the gem after she's had a, a little bit of a taste of success running the accounting over at the hardware store and is doing, you know, doing something that's a little bit more respectable and, and can bring you places. Wouldn't mind turning a fucking trick. Get the fuck out of here. We ain't hiring. 
fuck you anyways, Al, for not recognizing a figure of speech. It ain't one you ought to employ, you stupid bitch. I made a casual remark, an offhanded comment. I wouldn't mind turning a fucking trick. Operate out the back of his store, then you're so sad on lifting your skirts. Let some fuck filthy from the mines, breath rotten from his broken teeth, piss reeking, shit stinking fuck every hole in your body. What's the matter with you? I lose patience with cunts too ignorant to know when their lot's improved. A uh, thing that I've noticed from this rewatch. Who's your most underutilized character, do you think? Ooh. Um, I can give you a chance to think and explain mine. Sure. Uh, it took, I would have, before this rewatch, I would have swore that Hawks as Saul Star has more to do in this series. And he doesn't yeah. have a lot to do, really. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a really good one. Because, yeah, I remembered from my when i my memory of the first time i watched it i remembered him but i mean to be fair i only made it through like a season and a half yeah where he was more prominent he's prominent in the first season a little yeah, bit more I, yeah i remembered him being more prominent and i remembered woo being a lot more prominent oh interesting yeah uh and so i was very surprised this time around where he's he's only kind of at the forefront for a few episodes and then he kind of fades into the background yeah um i don't know if i would say he's the most he's underutilized because you know what do you do with that but Wu, you're talking um, about yes yeah, yeah. and we, I, we've I think, had a little bit of a purpose in this season he just hasn't been in every episode yeah i think it's got to be hawks yeah yeah he does a or lot possibly, of standing around possibly brian cox because it seems like they've already <laughs> ran out of stuff to do for him so. yeah the, the theater troupe isn't in this episode unfortunately yeah i, I think be, i mean the show's tough it's it's got a ton of actors um but I think that they're, I think that they, the Saul Star was, they, they clearly ran out of things for him to do, really, because he just, yeah. he's just in the hardware store, sort of blinking at people yeah. as they talk to him. I think the key is the characters who don't feel underutilized are the ones who have, um, you know, kind of like what we've said with, with Star Trek, with, uh, with Next Generation. The reason that those characters work is because when any two of them are in a scene together, you know, what the, right. their point of view is on the yeah. scene. Yeah. And I feel like even someone like the Doc Cochran, who doesn't get you, who's been kind of used less this season so far. Yeah. You know what he's, his deal is as soon as he enters the scene, you right. know, like it's, it's very, it's very clear. But with, with Saul, he's really kind of just a passive observer, observer at this point who like, yeah, people talk to he's him sort of, yeah, he's sort of, Bullock's conscience to a point, but not really. You know, yeah. he, they don't really give him a ton to do. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like most of his scenes end with with a cut to him where he kind of like bounces his eyebrows, like "Whoa, mm -hmm. that's crazy," <laughs> or "Whoa, I don't know." Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, uh, maybe they even um, the last episode where Trixie comes through the wall and talks to him, and she has like a mm -hmm. long monologue, and then she just ends it with like. So you want to get fucked? And he goes, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's, 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 <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just seems like he's a businessman who just, you know. Yep, gets what he can on to, the side. Wants to screw. Yeah, that's that's fine. It's kosher. Because uh, he's still technically running for mayor, right? Yeah, so like oh, the, yeah. The, that's I mean, all happening. <laughs> so if you really think about it, Saul is like the most normal person in the entire town. No, he really is. Yeah. If you if you were plucked out and put into Deadwood, you'd probably look like him, just sort of blinking at people as they talk to you. He's the bass player of Deadwood. I uh there's a great there's a great quote from John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. uh where um some he was doing an interview and, and someone was like, So is it true? All of the crazy things that they say about the band and blah 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 and he goes, I don't know, man. Nothing nothing interesting ever happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Was it Zeppelin? What's the fish story? That is yes, that that's, is Led Zeppelin. That's Bonham, yes. right? Yes. There yeah. was a uh hotel Gro groupie or something on, off the uh, that had a balcony overlooking the ocean. John Bonham was fishing and he caught a uh the the legend goes he caught a mud shark. <laughs> Which uh, <clears throat> they then That's the kind of detail that to, makes it a real story. Yes, exactly. That they then proceeded to uh, introduce to a hopefully, willing. hopefully, let's say willing groupie mm -hmm. um, 
in a very conscious, uh, intimate, <laughs> intimate way. <laughs> yeah, we've all seen the the Japanese porn. Just th- use that as your <laughs> as your stand-in. Yeah, the, uh, you know, it's no Richard Gere gerbil story, but it's up there, I suppose. Where, what is the genesis of that? I don't that know. is one of those things that yeah. I have known about since I was like twelve. Yeah, but I have no idea where it came from or how it spreads. So yeah. effectively that everyone would know about that. And imagine, imagine being Richard Gere. Is Richard Gere still alive? He's still alive, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what he's doing, but. No, no. He's kind of in the. Uh, the uh, he's one of those actors where. I, so I've been listening to uh, You Must Remember This. Yep. And they've been doing a series on uh, called Erotic 80s and Erotic 90s where they talk about um, sort of the rise and fall of. Uh, sex in movies, specifically yeah. like erotic thrillers and stuff. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> there's a big section where she talks about R- Richard Gere, and it's so interesting because like my pop culture experience with Richard Gere is like the back end of his career, where he had become the <clears throat> go-to answer for everybody's like aunt or mother to be like, who's the sexiest star? Like, oh my god. Richard Gere, oh, okay, right, so sexy, yeah. But and that, but like anything I knew him from was like, he's the the kind looking guy who marries Julia Roberts at the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but where at the beginning of his career he was a lot more like you know fiery on the screen and mm-hmm. up for <laughs> that's what that's what you, our mothers are remembering. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Same with Kevin Costner. Apparently, Kevin Costner was quite the hot thro- heartthrob early yeah. in his career yeah. in a way that makes me feel uncomfortable because it's like <laughs> it's like thinking of my uncle as a heartthrob. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he does the um, what's the Costner movie with uh, the base Bull Durham? Oh, Bull Durham, yeah. Bull Durham, sorry. I'm, I'm all fucked up with names. But that's <laughs> Susan Sarandon in that one, right? Yes, and Tim Robbins, yeah. Yeah. they. I think Costner and Sarandon have a sex scene in that that is like, because that's one of Amy's favorite movies, so I watch it every once in a while. But if I'm remembering, that sex scene is like, weirdly erotic it's like it's yeah. like very it's a very good sex scene but it's not something you would ex- be expecting from kevin, Co- kevin costner and susan sarandon i think but it just it, yeah. it really goes the whole distance yeah and like uh what's the other one no way out mm-hmm. which is a really steamy uh thriller that yep. he was in yeah did you ever see that movie weird crazy ending to that movie. no i don't think so what was it a Where, 90s or an 80s movie uh I think it was the 80s. Yeah. I think it was an 80s movie. But it's the whole thing is that he ends up getting, um, he sees Gene Hackman murder uh, his wife, yep. who Costner's having an affair with. Spoilers for this 35-year-old movie. Right. Um, and so he ends up getting framed for it. Costner and does. The, Costner ends up getting framed for it because uh, he was having an affair with the wife. Right. And so the whole movie is them is this like, you know, trying to find out who killed the wife and like it looks like the the net's coming down around him and like as this is going on they they're all in government like he's a I forget what Hackman's like a senator or something and he's like a general or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> he's a, a marine, high yeah. ranking marine. And as all this like sex thriller stuff is going on, there's a subplot about a Russian spy and it turns out that Kevin Costner is the Russian spy. <laughs> That's the end of the movie. Okay. It's, it's the craziest fucking thing I've ever seen. So I'm ha- not doing it justice. You need to see it. He has this affair, the and the whole thing is about this affair, but he also just turns out to be a sort of mole of the, the Russians yeah. that are in there. Yeah. yeah, and I think, like, I can't remember if him having the affair is a way for him to get information out of the world. I forget, but it's like this weird subplot that turns out that the whole time Kevin Costner was a Russian spy. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's very mm-hmm. strange. Yeah. Yeah. Now we should do the, uh, cause we should do a uh, run on Patreon of, um, cause I love all the eighties and nineties. Uh, God damn it. Michael. The, Crichton? No, the <laughs> Douglas. Michael Douglas, yeah, yeah, yes. All those movies are great, and they were, they were, yeah. they were just they all, they all have their charm. Yeah, I, yeah. Was, I, th- I thought you were going to say baseball movies, and I was like, man, I will talk about Major League for five hours. I can I see. I do. Would you say you like baseball movies? Uh, yes and no. It okay. depends on the movie. Like, I, I didn't care for Bull Durham, uh, yep. but I fucking love Major League. I think okay. Major League is one of the best 
comedies of the eighties. Yeah, I never. I if you were, I, I would assume I would say I nay to ninety percent of baseball movies that I can think of. Um, even ones that I think are like a league of their own, which I think was fine. I remember thinking it was kind of funny, but I I don't know if yeah, I would ever want to like watch that it one. again. I like that one quite a bit. All I can think of is uh, what it, we watch. It was the Quantum Leap episode we watched, right? The pilot of Quantum Leap ends with him jumping into a baseball game. Oh yes, yeah. I believe so. And yeah. he, he gets the hit or whatever. Um, yeah. So I think we've talked about everything here. There's just, I mean, just random notes at the end to wrap everything up. Uh, the Charlie Utter gives her shit in the jail cell is fantastic. I love yes. that scene. I think that's that really good. funny. Um, oh shit, George, this cocksucks dead. <laughs> <laughs> is that your fucking knife george hurst the, although it as reminds jokey, me of the scene sorry go ahead well as jokey as it is hurst leaving the cell going over taking the knife out and walking away with it is another great hurst moment yes you know very good yeah i was gonna say that reminded me of the scene from uh bad boys 2 where martin lawrence is talking to the corpse trying to get information like, with the other guy in the room and he's like what's right. that oh this motherfucker's dead. He ain't saying nothing. His brains is all over the end table. <laughs> oh, such a good movie. Yep. Yep. Uh, other sequence, Jane and Joni, uh, mm-hmm. very good with each other. Jane getting back to being drunk. Uh, Jane and the general has some really good. Uh, I, what is Jane saying? Question I wake up to in the morning and pass out with a fucking night. What's my popularity with my fellow white people? Yes. Um, <laughs> That's, I think... I was gonna the the hot take is this sounds like what most of uh, left wing Twitter says every it time is. they wake up. It's blue check, it's blue check, calamity Jane uh, sounding off. Uh, any other moments there just to bring them up? I, uh, I don't. Th- I, I mean the ending. The how's the finger? All right, Mister Hurst. How's the fucking ear? <laughs> yeah, that was a real uh, uh, send you back to the jerk store moment. I yes, think, for, yeah. for, for Bullock. <laughs> <laughs> good bullet. Jer- good. Jerk store. Jerk store called. Yeah, the jerk store Yeah, yeah. Uh, good bullet. Good. By dissembling our feelings, we keep the strategic edge. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then the the episode that sums the whole thing kind of up, and maybe the series. People are fucking people, and that is fucked up. Which is what James yes. says. Yeah. Yep. Pretty much. That's it. Do you have anything else you want to say about this one? Uh, no. I'm. You know, I can't. I can't decide how I feel about what they're doing with Jane because I feel like Jane is an easy character to just leave in the pocket and just do the same thing over and over again with. Yeah. Um, It's just tough because, like you said, they've kind of reset a lot of the characters and it seemed like Jane was sort of trending away from just being a a drunk Yes, but then they kind of pulled her right back in the same way they kind of did with Alma. Um, it's I think it's frustrating because it is same with Alma. It is the more realistic depiction. I think like I don't. It's not just going to take Joni being nice to her and giving her a bath, and all of a sudden Jane is not an alcoholic anymore. You right. know. Sorry, um, did you say it's the same with Alma? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it, it is a more realistic depiction of of that type of person. Yeah. But. I think that's what makes it frust. That's it's frustrating as a character on the show who's like, oh, there's room for growth here, but they they've just chosen not to do it. Yeah, I think I I think it's a theme of the show, really. Like yeah. the, the other one that does that, which matches the Jane, is that like Jane won't listen to you. Is that like the Odell storyline is the same thing? It's like you you there are people who you try to help who just are not going to be able to be helped, really. Yeah, and I think Odell is that because. You know, Aunt Leo and um, the general try to talk some sense into him to stop him from doing whatever he's plotting to be doing, and he's he's not going to listen. Jane is the same way, which is that it's the some people just can't be helped, but there's like this tremendous feeling of the other people who orbit that person that they need to help or they have to keep yeah. trying to help. And I think that yeah. Milch was an addict, and Milch went through all that stuff, and I think that that's just something that weighs on his head about like how much uh, needed other people. But it's the the bigger the bigger thematic point is that like the the town is filled with people who are trying to help each other right all the time like this episode is kind of about like the recalibration and fixing of errors down from like you know, Swearingen trying to help Bullock out of this mess that he's made and trying to help the whole town Joni's trying to help Jane with the stuff that she's done um, carrying Hostetler's coffin you know like crossing sort of the racial 
boundaries that Jane does mm-hmm. with the general. But it stands in direct opposition to Hearst, who, as we mentioned, stands alone, literally, through everything. And like Hearst's, Hearst's desire to burn everything down is just his own impulses and not – he has no connection to anybody else. He finds himself above other people. He has that, you know, I, I can sort only with niggers and white people who obey me like dogs thing that he had that quote from. Right. He yeah. just – he is – isolated and the, the what the show is saying is that the community is the something that almost keeps you healthy in a way yeah yeah that's it anything else uh, about this one this is something pretty the podcast we're done talking i have to say the title now because all the ai stuff only picks up the title when you say it in the podcast <laughs> and it, like, what? It, when you run those AI audio features that are only going to become more prominent when it goes through and it sort of summarizes like audio for you it mm-hmm. can't identify the podcast unless you say it in it, obviously. Oh. So it's I feel like it's something I have to start saying, but I don't know. We'll see. Ten years from now we'll see where we stand. They don't they don't just do it the way humans do or they you know, that one the one when they talk about Deadwood. That podcast. That's right. Yes, it should be. Every every podcast should just be a friend's title and just slap it on there. That's it. Thanks, everybody. This is Something Pretty Podcasting. You can support the show at patreon.com slash the Penske file. We'll be continuing our coverage of the show. Moving into the next episode, which is, I forget what it's called, but as I looked it up, Clay, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, check out Rotten Horror Picture Show, <clears throat> approaching our 100th episode. I say approaching, we're at like episode 87 or something, so it's going to be like like 20 weeks before we get to, <laughs> to, to 100, if not more. Um, uh, but we've got, uh, <clears throat> on Patreon, we're doing Rotten, uh, the video nasties. September is Dario Argento's Inferno. We just did Toby Hooper's Fun House, so we're getting all the uh, some big names, some uh, big gore. It's been a lot mm-hmm. of fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just, on Badass, <clears throat> we just finished season two of Batman Beyond, and we're on a bit of a break, but Sean and I did a uh, panel at Granite City Comic Con a couple weeks ago, which was recorded, and so we put that out as a little special episode where we just kind of yap about Batman for about an hour, 45 minutes or so. So check it out. And as always, the Star Trek podcast, if you like Star Trek, continues, which is me and Clay talking about Star Trek. So the next Deadwood podcast is a famous, uh, next episode is a famous one. A lot of people consider this one to be a top tier episode oh, of the really? series. It's called Unauthorized Cinnamon. So we'll see. Oh, that's the worst kind. It is. You, 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 you must authorize your cinnamon if there yeah, is to be any pissed. cinnamon. It, it, uh, around this time, anytime I go to Starbucks, if I order a pumpkin drink, Yes. And they give me cinnamon without me explicitly saying I want it. <laughs> what about uh, whipped cream on your hot cocoa? Do you, do you, are you Ooh. a whipped cream on the hot cocoa person? I or? mean, I wouldn't throw that out yeah, of Yeah, are you going to be upset with the people if they put it on there? No, no. no. I always, I, they always get really confused, though, because uh, when I order those drinks, I always ask for almond milk. Yes. And then um, they go, do you still want the whipped cream? I'm like, sure. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Does it have to be made of almonds or can this just be regular cow cream? <laughs> yeah, we have um uh Chick-fil-A has the shakes and they always mm. put the whipped cream on. They have like the peach milkshake with the whipped cream oh, on top. And interesting. It's, like, it's so goddamn good. All right. The kids love Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A. Nothing wrong with Chick-fil-A. And I always want Chick-fil-A on Sunday and I can never get it, but that is my <laughs> that is my cross to bear. <laughs> it's really really breaking open some deep-seated trauma here. they they why i always wanted on sunday and of course they you know so sabbath or whatever uh chick-fil-a considers it to be oh, so they're never open i see i see i can't i literally can't get chick-fil-a on sunday and it's the only day that i i want it thanks everybody buy it on spy it on saturday keep it in the fridge heat it up the next day it's funny because they're not open on sundays but whenever uh, you visit a Chick-fil-A, the cashier always says, why don't you cap your visit with some complimentary higher-end pussy, which I think is a weird thing to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Only say that to the men, though, because it's Chick-fil-A. <laughs> That's right. Thanks very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the content. We'll be back with Unauthorized Cinnamon next week. See ya. I can't help no- noticing in you just now, Mr. Blazanoff. Uh, I'm sad. I see. I imagine my murdered parents, they were killed on their farm while I was a student in Petersburg. I imagine their bodies, 
like the men we found on our walking. We are swept up, are we not? By the large events and forces of our times. How much they saved to send me for study.